there's very few of us who have not lost loved ones, those who maybe were extremely close to us, a, a parent, a sibling, maybe even a child, that for others it may be that you're in those twilight years of life and you know that time is growing shorter and maybe you begin to contemplate going to that final resting place a lot more lightly. And in those moments, it's real easy for us to feel like we've been defeated, that something beyond our control is happening, and it causes terror, and it hurts. But this morning, as Paul is addressing in this, Paul describes these moments as being a victory. And indeed, this quarter in our studies, in our OSH lessons with our young people, it is a quarter where we're going to talk about a lot about God's victory and how it is that God attains victory. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you're ready for your, your three words to see the notebooks this morning. All right, very good. Here's your three words that actually come from the context. Uh, steadfast, immovable, and abounding. And so we're going to look to, at those words toward the end of the lesson. And that's what the lesson is going to be moving toward, is the way in which we view the resurrection should lead us to being steadfast, immovable, and always abounding. If we're not steadfast, if we're not immovable, if we're not always abounding, then it's probably because we have a skewed view and maybe we're not thinking enough about the resurrection. Maybe we're thinking too much about death, but not enough about resurrection. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on as Paul does as well. You remember in the Corinthian letter that Paul is addressing a lot of different problems that the church was going through. That in the very beginning, he has to address things like the uh, sectarianism, the, the, the uh, division that existed between them because of the way in which they were saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ. And Paul has to tell them, you're thinking very carnally minded. And that way in which they were focusing upon the fleshly components of their life as Christians and not the spiritual realities that it's based upon led to a lot of problems. That even when you get into chapter 5, they're not dealing with an individual that needs to be withdrawn from by the congregation, and they're puffed up about that very thing. Chapter 6, they're going to law against one another and suing one another. Chapter 7, they're having problems with the should we marry or should we not marry? And what is the right relationship between the husband and wife? What if one's a believer and one's not a believer? Then chapters 8, 9, and 10 and dealing with the kinds of things that <clears throat> focus around, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> that focus around the individual desires to either participate in something or not to participate. And how should we view one another? It bleeds over into the, the head covering in chapter 11 and the Lord's Supper. 12, 13, and 14 with the use of, of spiritual gifts. And the host of problems is unending in this book because of the way in which they are dwelling on carnal factors. And even here in chapter 15, when Paul lays out the very basic essence of what the gospel message is in the first few verses of chapter 15, you have those who cannot get beyond the fact that how can it be that if someone goes to the grave that they will ever live again? Is there any power that's even powerful enough to bring forth someone from the grave? And Paul points out not only from the grave, but to deliver them into heaven itself. And Paul makes it his case based upon one simple reality, because Jesus Christ came forth from the grave. And he even says in this chapter, in verse 33, that evil communication, and some of your versions render it differently. Mine says, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. And that's a verse that we use, and correctly so, to say if you hang out with bad company, you develop bad habits. But what this is in the context of is this. If they don't believe in the resurrection, they're going to act like there's no resurrection. And people who act like there's no resurrection are not the kind of people that you need to be around. And it's going to corrupt you. So those people who don't believe that there's a resurrection, that you're coming forth from the grave, who don't live in sight of that resurrection, those are not the kind of people you should be around because they're corruptible. That's a strong statement from Paul, and it's one that bears us understanding. So in setting up the chapter, verses 50 through 53, that was read for us a few moments ago, Paul makes it very clear that there has to be a change. Earlier in this chapter, he talks about all the flesh in verse 39 is not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of varying things. Birds were created with a body that makes them suitable for flying. Fish were made with bodies that made them suitable for swimming underwater and breathing underwater. The human body was created and suited so that it might dwell upon this earth. It was not suited and built to dwell in all eternity. 
And because of that, this body has to be put off. It has to be changed. So Paul says that this body, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Because not only is it corruptible by time and by disease, but it's susceptible to all these fleshly desires that we so often fall victim to and pray to and give ourselves over to. Notice that he says that this I say, brethren, in verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption does not inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul says it this way in Romans 7 and verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It is a body of death, not just in that, as Paul was talking about in Romans 7, this battle that goes on between what it is that God wants us to be and what it is that my flesh wants me to indulge in. But it is a battle that's going to go on throughout the time that I exist within this body that I'm living in. But chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says this, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And he gives thanks to God for this very fact because he can be delivered from it and he knows that it's true. There is a semblance of that deliverance now as we're walking according to the Spirit. Not as he's been telling the Corinthians, do not walk according to the flesh. As he told the Romans, don't walk according to the flesh. As Paul told the Galatians, don't walk according to the flesh. As the entire scriptures are screaming to us from beginning to end, do not walk according to the flesh. The flesh is corruptible. It's going to die. It's going to be changed and put off. You have to be living according to something that is much greater and much more powerful. Brethren, if we live according to the flesh, we will indeed die because there's no future in it. There's no sustainability in it. There's no eternity that's built into it. But if we live according to the Spirit, that soul that dwells within us, that will motivate us to live as God would have us to live because it lasts forever. In these verses, I want you to notice something that Paul, when he talks about this uh, flesh and blood, let there be light again. When, when you have uh, the flesh and blood and the corruptible nature of our bodies, that he says that this change is going to happen very quickly. It's instantaneous in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Paul gives similar language in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, as Paul says here, this should give us comfort, not dread, and not fear. Paul says there's going to be a change that takes place. And there's two terms that he uses I want you to take note of. He tells us when, he uses the word when, and then he uses the word then. He tells us the when this victory is going to be received. That when is when that last trumpet sounds. That when is when the Lord descends from the heavens. That when is when we go through this transformation. But notice that he also says that there is a then. When those things take place, notice what he says then. When we receive this resurrected, glorious, and perishable body, Paul says, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I did some, some research on that phrase and, and looking up the context of it. And back in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8 is where that particular phrase is used. And it's talking about the fact that there's uh, going to be a deliverance and all the nations are going to be able to proclaim the praises of God and that death is going to be swallowed up in victory, that it's going to be consumed. But there's another part of that passage when you see the next quote in verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? And that's from Hosea chapter 13. I want us to, to take a look at that. Hosea chapter 13. Hosea 13 in verse 14, in, when, when Paul is using that phrase, and something that Paul does in a lot of his writings that really appeals to me, Paul seems to be somewhat sarcastic in a lot of the statements that he makes. And he makes very strong points. And so when, when Paul is saying, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? It's not 
Paul searching for an answer to that question so much as it is, so where's your sting now? Where's your victory now? What are you going to be able to do now? And when you go back to Hosea chapter 13, you see that that's the way that it bears itself out. Hosea 13, my Bible even puts a heading for this chapter, Relentless Judgment on Israel. And when you go through that chapter, you see that there are several judgments that God is making upon Israel and other nations because of the way in which they've done various things. But one semblance of hope that's given is there in verse 14 where God says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. It's not so much that Paul is making a question, giving a question, as he is referencing these statements. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. You think about how God looked at death and the judgment upon those who are ungodly and how it is that they could be bought back or redeemed even from the grave and even from destruction. That God can say to death, I will be your plagues. Death, you, you think that you're so strong and powerful that you're a plague upon all of mankind? I will be your plague. I will not have pity upon death. I will destroy death. That's what God accomplished. But as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 15, it's because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is so much strength that's found, not just in the example that Jesus lived a, sin, a sinless life, and because of that sinless life, he gave, gave death no opportunity to take advantage of him. You see Jesus upon the cross and you think that there's been this great victory that death has won, that gra the grave has won. He's been taken by lawless hands, as it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, that Jesus being delivered and determined by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. But God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. There was no way in the world that Jesus was going to stay in that grave. It had been foretold long before. Jesus himself had said it. It had been shown over and over and over again that Jesus had this power. And yet, where were the disciples on the first day of the week? Why was there so much weeping around the grave? And no one was there to see the deliverance and the loosening of the, the bonds upon them on that first day of the week. That when they even went to the grave, it was because they could prepare his body further and observe the tomb where they laid him. And so you think about Jesus, it was not possible. And so when it comes to our loved ones who die in Christ, when it comes to us, when we close our eyes that final time and take our last breath. Brethren, it will not be possible for the grave to hold us. It's not going to be possible. Because when the Lord gives that command at the final trumpet, all are going to come forth. And we're all going to come forth in a changed body. Our bodies will be changed into a form fit to be with God forever in heaven. But if you're not a Christian this morning, you're also going to come forth from that grave with a changed body. A body that will make it through all eternity forever being burned in a devil's hell's fire. Where it's described as, as having this worm that does not cease to eat. Because your flesh does not go away, but it never stops gnawing at that flesh. You think about that imagery that Jesus gives us and the terror that it should give us. But for us, brethren, that should give us so much hope because that's not where we're going to be. We'll never have to experience it. But that one time, maybe, and that's only if we die before the Lord returns. But we're all going to be there on that day. Jesus was not held because, as it says in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, God had highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee is going to bow. Jesus took part in flesh as us, as it says in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil." and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That fear of death holds us captive. 
We need to stop thinking so much about death and start thinking a lot more about resurrection. Death doesn't have sting anymore. Death doesn't have victory anymore. What gives us that strength and encouragement to face it is knowing that we're going to rise in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll all be changed. That's how we receive that victory is because of Jesus Christ. And notice also that this victory is something that God gives to us. I would encourage you in verse 57 of 1 Corinthians 15 to underline that phrase, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. It is not yours in that you obtained it somehow. It's not yours in that you were able to conquer the grave, that you were able to conquer sin, but that Jesus Christ did. And therefore, God gives you that victory. Remember last month, we looked at the lesson where it talks about God leading us in a procession of victory and having that aroma that comes with victory as of the conquering general who would go through the streets with the uh, idolatrous priests who would have their fragrant lamps and it would uh, go throughout the whole city and would lead us, lead his soldiers in that procession. Paul uses that same imagery to talk about the kind of victory that we have as well. This victorious language is one to not be uh, forgotten. As Paul says earlier, even in this chapter, in verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As it was in Adam, all die, but in Christ all can be made alive or shall be made alive. Each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And then comes the end when Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father and when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. The last enemy that shall be destroyed, verses 25 and 26, is death. That's the only victory that's waiting to happen. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, let's go there together. Romans 6, verses 4 through 9. You know these verses well because we use them in talking about when a person is baptized, what it is that's taking place. And in verse 4, it reminds us in Romans 6 and verse 4 that we were reminded that we were buried with him, with Christ, into baptism. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has uh, died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we also shall live with him. Knowing this, verse 9, knowing this, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. When we became a Christian, that's that moment in time where death should no longer carry that fear, that dread. The idea of a sting, the idea of a victory obtained by the grave or by death should no longer be a factor in our lives because we have died with Christ. And just as sure as Christ was raised from the dead, so we also shall be. We've done it in this life and that we have the opportunity to live new lives that are sinless, but we also have that opportunity for all, throughout all eternity because of what Christ did. God has given us that victory. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's mercy. That's why it's based on his loving kindness because this is what God has given to us. You cannot obtain that yourself. We cannot defeat Satan on our own. It's what Jesus Christ did. And that last enemy that's going to be destroyed is even death itself. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. When we respond to Christ's commandments in faith, in belief, knowing that Christ did these things for us, and we respond in obedient faith, that's when we gain that victory. But also, these last few minutes, I want to talk about the, the motivation that should give us. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 57 again, and going to 58. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. One of the things that it tells us is that it's a therefore. Therefore, we should live lives that are very thankful. How thankful should we be to know that when that loved one of mine who was a Christian, when they closed their eyes that last time, 
And in that moment, we had to say our goodbye for a temporary time. That they're going to be with the Lord forever. They've walked through that door. They've went through that passageway. They did that thing that was necessary to exit this life. And because of that, they can be in the arms of the Lord forever. Even as Paul himself was looking forward to. It tells us in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything has been made available to us, including that very last moment of time because of Christ. And we should bless his name as a result. Paul also says that we need to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding. The word steadfast means steady and constant and settled. To be immovable carries the same idea of being firm and secure. I, I saw a video a few weeks ago that, that was pretty fun to watch. I don't know why this particular college was doing it, but they were taking some of their, um, their football players and they would stand them up with their pads on, and they would stand them in front of a, a, a mat. And then about 10 yards away, they put that player's mother, also in pads and a helmet. And they let their mother take off at full speed and hit their son in full pads. Now, some of them, like when they hit the quarterback or the punter, they knocked them over. But this one particular lineman was there, Looked like he weighed seven, eight hundred pounds probably. His mother, about a hundred pounds, soaking wet. Now she took off running as hard as she could as well. And when she hit him, he didn't move. She did, but he did not. She crumbled on that. When we think about being steadfast and immovable, that's who we are. You let anything in the world hit you and you don't move. It doesn't matter the sacrifice, it doesn't matter the pain, it doesn't matter the tribulation, it doesn't matter the hardships, it doesn't matter the sacrifices, it doesn't matter what you have to do, that life itself hits you hard, as hard as it can, and you don't move. Brethren, it's time to get serious about that. It's time to, to be real about that. It's time to quit talking about that. It's time to see what Paul says about being steadfast and immovable because of the thankfulness that we have in what Christ has done and stop moving so much. Stop buckling like you're the punter and start standing like a lineman. It's time to get serious about that. You read through the scriptures when it talks about faith and obviously we know that it's something that we have to grow and increase in. But don't you think it's time? You know, when you examine yourself, don't you think it's time? When you see some of the things that's caused you to buckle, that's, that's caused us to, to get weak knee, to be afraid, don't you think it's ample time that we stop giving in to it? Don't be like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by every wind. Don't be childish in your thinking that every doctrine that comes along, you can't get settled on it. That when it comes to making that decision you know you need to make, that you're no longer wishy-washy. That you choose what the Lord would have you to do and you do it. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Be that rock, that anchor. You want to be a good influence on others? You want people to take Christianity seriously because of the fact they know you? Then be steadfast. Be immovable. And don't be shaken by what the world throws. We're told in Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 3 therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and then it gives Jesus himself as the example Jesus knows what it's like to go through the things you went through Jesus went through them in the flesh as well Jesus created you. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about this world. There's nothing he has to learn about that. And just to prove it, he experienced it. And he learned it that way as well. So Jesus himself, it says, Look to him who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Paul understood what it was like himself. When you go back to the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, in which you also received, and in which you, notice this, in which you stand. 
by which you also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul understood it in his own life. Paul says that he had to work more abundantly than they all. But it wasn't him, but it was the grace of God that was with him. We need to know that we do not have to give in. You do not have to compromise. You do not have to, God even forbids it, give an inch to the kinds of things that go on in our world. You don't have to. You're forbidden from it. You're exhorted to do the opposite. And if you don't do the opposite, you're not steadfast. You're not immovable. And you're certainly not always abounding. And notice that even when it talks about the always abounding, that it's not an occasional abounding. It's not an every now and then abounding. It's not a Sunday morning abounding. It's not a Sunday night or Wednesday night abounding. It's an always abounding. And abounding doesn't mean that you're kind of moving. It means you're overflowing. There's an abundance that's given. You're always abounding in the work of the Lord. But if I'm not, it's because I'm thinking too much about death, I'm thinking too much about the flesh, and I'm not thinking enough about the resurrection. And I'm certainly not living a life that's thankful. Paul also says in these verses that we need to know for a fact that the things we do actually matter. I'm convinced that a lot of times when Christians are not doing what they should, it's because we don't think it matters. We think it's a waste of time. It's not going to make a difference. People are not going to notice. People are going to do what they're going to do anyway. And there's a host of other devilish excuses that we give for not knowing that our labor is not in vain. When you don't give in, when you don't compromise, when you're always doing and always abounding, Paul says you're not wasting your time. Your labor has value. I think it had value for Paul. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, you remember as he's writing this letter to Timothy, he's hoping that he gets to see Timothy that one last time. He, he's begging for him to come before wintertime. And Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight, I've, kept the, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid it for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me. And not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. You think about that moment when Paul was in that cell. And it was the last day that he was in that cell. And the soldiers come down, and they open the door, and they bring him out. And they take him to the place where they're going to put his head upon a stump, and they're going to raise the axe to cut his head off. You think Paul looked at that moment as being a moment of defeat or a moment of victory? The world looks at it and they see themselves rid of someone like Paul. Thank goodness he's gone. That voice has been silenced. Where for Paul, that was a moment of deliverance, a moment of victory. You think about all the great heroes of faith. The prophets of old who faced those same types of moments, moments of victory and not defeat. Brethren, we should look forward to that moment of our own deliverance. As it says in Revelation 14, 13, John says, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead. Not pitiable are the dead. Not forsaken or forgotten are the dead. But blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works, they're always abounding in the, in the work of the Lord. Those works follow them. As Romans 8 and verse 37 tells us, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's what the resurrection is supposed to be for us. And as we're studying from the, the concept of victory this quarter, keep in mind, don't think so much about death, but think a whole lot more about resurrection. Understand that this life is temporary. It's meant to be. This flesh cannot inherit kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. It has to be transformed, and it's going to be transformed. And so the question I'm going to leave with you this morning is this, one, is will you be victorious over sin and death? We conquer sin in this life that we might have deliverance from death in the end, and that's what God has given to us. And so if you're subject to the invitation this morning,
If you've not yet obeyed the gospel, if you've not yet been baptized for the mission of your sins, or you've forsaken the way and you need help in coming back, and you need the brethren to be here for you, to support you, to pray for you, and to guide you along the way, whatever that need may be, please come as together we stand and sing this song.